Hello and welcome to a new Israel Gaza war update. It has been some time since the last update and a lot has happened so there will be a lot of footage we go through today. In this update we take a look at the most significant release clips again and what they could signify. Please remember to show your support through a like and comment. It was a lot of work. In northern Gaza it seems the Israeli military now finished its initial shaping operation to fully encircle Gaza City and the siege is now complete. After a week-long ceasefire, the IDF has now also initiated an expansion of their ground operations into southern Gaza. They have encircled the areas around Jarara and Ashurich while simultaneously moving into Khan Yunis. The first video I want to go through with you today is this helmet cam video showing Israeli soldiers of the 188th Brigade Combat Team operating together with Israeli Special Forces in a school in the heart of the Shejaya neighborhood in Gaza. During their operation, the men encountered Hamas fighters from the 74th Battalion who attempted to lure the Israeli troops into an ambush with gunfire and explosives. The chaotic scenes you see right here are filmed from inside the school as the Israeli soldiers seem to have cornered at least one Hamas fighter. While it looks from the footage that they were in control of the situation, I wanted to point out that it appears the situation was hairier than it may look at first glance. If you watch closely on the right, you can see bullet holes in the metal sheet at head level of the soldier on the right, indicating that there was a real danger of being exposed to sporadic but dangerous gunfire for the men. Furthermore, a little bit further back, there was also an open door that offered a shooting angle for any potential adversaries hiding in that room. However, it has to be said that this was the first time these fighters from the Al Hameron Brigade entered combat as part of the brigade combat teams in Gaza and I am sure this was already evaluated by them in an after action report. This video depicts fighters from the 931st Infantry Battalion engaging in an urban firefight with Hamas members during recent operations of the Nail Brigade combat team in Jabalia. According to an Israeli Defense Force press release, the soldiers received information about the presence of Hamas fighters and weapons in buildings adjacent to them and decided to launch a targeted attack on these structures. However, the Hamas fighters had already set up an ambush in the area and attacked the Israeli forces as they advanced along the main road. In response, the unit filming the operation bypassed the enemy position through one of the nearby alleys and surprised them from behind. A firefight ensued in which the Palestinian fighters fired upon the Israeli troops and threw grenades at them. The Israelis responded with grenades, small arms fire and a handheld rocket launcher of the Matador type. In the course of other encounters throughout operations in the same area, the fighters of the 931st Battalion engaged in more close-range face-to-face -face engagements, uncovering weapons and Hamas infrastructure in the process. The IDF reported that several Palestinian fighters were taken out during these engagements and shared a short segment confirming at least two Hamas fighters armed with RPGs who got KIA. I had to cut this segment out of the YouTube edit but mentioning it here for transparency. During further operations in the Jabalia neighborhood, fighters of the Israeli Yalam unit received information about the presence of more Hamas fighters in the area and their preparations to attack and ambush IDF forces. As a response, the IDF soldiers conducted targeted raids within the area and identified suspicious movements in one of the buildings leading to a close-range engagement and a following raid of the building. The IDF forces documented the fighting on helmet cameras. A short disclaimer, this update will feature a lot of helmet cam footage but later more to this. Also in Jabalia, during a patrol conducted by members from the Nail Brigade, IDF forces engaged in direct combat with two Hamas fighters in one of the many alleyways running through Gaza. According to the IDF, one Palestinian was taken out immediately while the other attempted to flee while still engaging the Israeli troops. After a brief exchange of gunfire, the unit's task force directed ground troops from the air in the dense and complicated area. This of course according to the IDF, one Palestinian was shown by them but I had to cut this out as well. The Israeli soldiers located dozens of weapons in the past week. Also, the combat team of the NATO Brigade of the 162nd Division has taken out over 50 Hamas fighters in the Jabalia area so far. Again, this is all based on official IDF statements and hard to confirm even if the number sounds plausible. Here we can see pretty interesting footage from members of the Israeli Galani Brigade as they use grenade launchers in the area of Shajer. The area is considered to be a Hamas stronghold. The brigade's fighters uncovered approximately 15 tunnel shafts and located a large quantity of ammunition. In recent days, the brigade's fighters engaged with Hamas fighters firing from a school at Israeli forces. 2014, the Galani Brigade already fought in this area during Operation Protective Edge, so their deployment to this area again has a pretty personal note, or what do you think? Over the last couple of weeks, the Israeli Defense Forces released a really high number of helmet cam videos showing their troops in close urban combat during their ongoing urban operations in northern Gaza. 
This marks an interesting shift in the way Israel portrays this war on social media. As I mentioned in my last Israel Gaza war update, most of the footage we previously saw from the Israeli side mainly consisted of hand-picked pieces recorded by Israeli combat cameramen and footage of precision strikes. Interestingly, the current helmet camera videos fit surprisingly well with the actual state of the operations, which have transitioned more and more into urban clearance operations in close quarters. With each step forward, the encounters become more personal for both involved parties, who now face each other at very short distances and difficult terrain more often after the initial shaping operation to encircle Gaza City was completed. While all the videos are still handpicked, polished pieces that had to be reviewed and cleared for release by the Israeli military, the general nature of helmet cameras still gives the events a more personal touch. It allows us to catch a glimpse of what it is currently like to operate in this environment for the Israeli soldiers. Critics often dismiss this kind of footage as sensationalizing and lacking depth, especially since polished segments like the ones we see here, whether intentional or not, can often lack or hide the full broader picture, such as all the other aspects that come with these kinds of operations. I, for my part, however, believe that every piece of information can be valuable and, in this context, also holds historic significance. There is a German quote that says, journalists are the second hands of world history. If this is true, then videos like this truly can be considered the milliseconds of that very same history and should be seen as such. Notable from the footage is that the Israeli soldiers maintain tight cohesion as they move through the urban terrain and narrow alleyways while advancing with fire. This is still interesting since, while I pointed out in my previous report on this war, that there was a notable lack of drones and IEDs, especially IEDs still remain to be the number one threat for the attacking force in such operations. That's why it is quite surprising that we have seen close to none of these attacks on Israeli forces since the start of the ground operations. It could be that the IDF combat engineers, who are a vital part of these operations, simply did a good job in neutralizing weapons caches and clearing explosive booby traps. Additionally, it could also be that Israel has effective electronic warfare systems in place that jam especially radio-triggered IEDs, giving Hamas no chance to detonate them. All in all, the overall lack of these explosive devices is very notable given the nature of this fight. Still, as this footage from a bottom-up building clearance shows, the soldiers have to constantly watch their steps because behind every corner there might be a hidden booby trap or rifle just waiting for them. That's why urban combat is considered to result in high stress levels for soldiers, effectively burning them out. This is why good commanders must always plan for the relief or replenishment of their forces. Since the current Israeli operations can be considered to be conducted in a somewhat controlled environment, this should be possible here. Also, we saw the soldiers operating very close to their armored vehicles, what can be dangerous for them under certain circumstances and these conditions. However, given the fact that Hamas still mainly focuses their attacks on Israeli armored vehicles, at least based on the footage that they keep releasing, this seems to be a risk the Israelis have to take. In the end, however, all military operations entail risks, and urban operations, in particular, invariably involve high costs and risks. They demand substantial resources, especially in terms of deploying significant numbers of soldiers and units to efficiently clear and secure specific sections of terrain. It seems that the IDF has divided the entire Gaza Strip into different sectors, each assigned a specific number. Officially, they state that this is to manage the flow of civilians, limiting casualties. However, these sectors most likely also function as areas of operations set to be cleared one by one by IDF forces. With over a thousand of them, it is uncertain whether the IDF truly intends to address each one, but the likelihood of their willingness to do so is high. In fact, by the time I was recording this update, the Israeli military had already extended its operations to the south of Gaza, where it is in the process of encircling several areas, including Khan Yunis, the home of Hamas's Gaza chief, Yahir Sinwa. In this segment, we can observe IDF soldiers employing the preferred method of navigating urban terrain, namely moving through buildings to minimize exposure to linear danger areas as much as possible even if one clip here just showed the crossing of such an area. In general, open areas, and perhaps even any area under the open sky, should be avoided as much as possible. Participants in urban combat should only step outside if they absolutely have to. However, this is often not possible for the attackers, especially during the advance. Since people often claim that the soldiers are shooting at nothing, not only in this video but basically in every video, I wanted to address not only that this is suppressing fire, the effectiveness of which will be showcased later in this video, but also the ammunition consumption in urban terrain. 
The second battle in Forlacher has shown that urban warfare can require four times as much ammunition, or sometimes even more, compared to combat in other environments. This includes not only small arms ammunition, but also precision-guided munitions, active protection system rounds on vehicles, rockets, artillery, mortars, tank rounds, and much more. If I remember correctly, the number of fired small arms rounds in Afghanistan was 250,000 per each insurgent taken out, and this was fighting mostly in remote areas. For this, I have to say that the usage of hand grenades on camera is surprisingly low. We saw the usage of quite a few on the barrel grenade launchers, but not that many hand grenades, especially in situations where normal urban combat doctrine usually advises their use. This could be because of the IDF's rules of engagement, but this is open for debate. There is one video showing a questionable use of a flashbang by Israeli soldiers, but I cannot show this one on YouTube. However, it is included in the Telegram edit on my private Telegram channel for people who have become members there. The link is in the description. If you found this video interesting and appreciate the effort I put into it, please let me know through a like and comment. This helps the video reach more people. What you see here is helmet cam footage of the Israeli Special Forces Unit Maglan. This is a commando unit whose mission is to operate deep in enemy territory while focusing on attacking and destroying specific targets and gathering accurate intelligence. Maglan was established in June 1986 as an elite unit specializing in anti-tank warfare using advanced weapons. It is a part of the Commando Brigade. Though Maglan is part of the IDF's Commando Brigade, its operators undergo basic training with the Paratroopers Brigade. While founded in 1986, its existence was only declassified in 2006. It was among the first units to respond to the attacks on October 7th. Recruits of the unit train extensively for 18 months in what is considered to be one of the most challenging training courses in the IDF. Physical demands are intense, with candidates carrying equipment weighing about 70% of their body mass over several dozen kilometers. Unfortunately, the demanding nature of the program results in about two-thirds of candidates dropping out. In this video, we see Israeli soldiers from the 14th Reserve Brigade conducting an operation to secure the so-called Felsten outpost in the northern Gaza Strip. The outpost was used by Hamas as a training ground and as a base to prepare and conduct attacks. The IDF said its soldiers directed aircraft and artillery strikes destroying launching posts for mortars and anti-tank rockets, observation posts and what the military called significant command and control infrastructure. If you've watched until now, I wanted to say thank you and I hope that you stick with me throughout this whole video. There is a lot more to cover. I just wanted to take this short break to express my gratitude, especially to my loyal core viewers who watch and like every video. You are awesome and the reason I keep this format running, even though it can be quite challenging to produce. Despite all this polished, hand-picked, high-quality footage, we also have to address losses. Urban operations, and I know this video will largely serve as a lecture on urban operations, generally result in higher casualties than other military operations. This not only includes combatants, but also civilians, and perhaps the losses are even higher due to the presence of civilians. It is estimated that the number of civilian losses has surpassed 17,000 as I am working on this update. For Israeli soldiers, it has been reported that the number of lost personnel currently lies at around 90th of December 8, 2023. This number does not include the losses from the October 7 attacks. The number surpasses the amount of losses Israel took during their 2014 campaign in Gaza, where the IDF lost about 67 soldiers. I will not go too much into detail here, even if I know many people will criticize me for not mentioning or showing this or that. To those people, I have to say that I am war leaks and not Human Rights Watch. Also, it can be that I get things wrong here and there, but in the end, we all have to agree that I am creating content for YouTube and not West Point. I try to be as accurate as possible, but you have to understand that I run my channel on a very small budget with humble means. I want you to know that I am doing my best to steadily increase the quality, even if this channel is currently a one-man show, despite the fact that the work I do is usually done by three to five people on other channels. For this I hope I am doing quite well, but this is for you to decide. While urban operations may result in strategically unacceptable casualty rates, as seen during the IDF's Operation Peace for Galilee in 1982, it has to be mentioned that the IDF's losses are currently lower than estimated by many so far. This most likely comes thanks to good preparations and the cautious approach showcased since the beginning of the ground invasion. Also, the approximately week-long ceasefire that was in place from November 24th to November 30th played a role in this. In the end, every day that does not see fighting statistically reduces the casualty rates. Losses, however, are unavoidable, as sad as it sounds. Bombing and close air support can assist but cannot win urban operations by themselves. Infantry is crucial, 
and this infantry will be exposed to dangers. Air power or other heavy weapons, such as artillery, used alone usually necessitate the complete destruction of urban areas rather than seizing and holding terrain to achieve objectives. However, this is often strategically counterproductive, as stated by the Modern War Institute at West Point. Not to mention the effect this has on the informational warfare domain, where many see Israel already having the disadvantage due to their heavy bombing campaigns. The Palestinians, on their side, have also released footage, but compared to the Israelis, who offered new insights through the extensive use of helmet cameras. The overall footage did not provide new perspectives, and the number of videos was not as high as in the previous update. However, there are a few things I wanted to speak about regarding the videos that came out, so I included a fair share that we go over now. More that I cannot show here would be included in the Telegram edit of this video. This clip caught my attention because it shows that despite seeing fewer drone videos than anticipated so far, Hamas still uses drones for what appears to be spotting and directing mortar fire even if on a limited scale only. The clip also seems to have been the first time we see them engaging a larger concentration of IDF forces. In general they still try to avoid the Israeli main body as much as possible and their entire doctrine seems to be based on the fight against tanks and armored vehicles. There were some videos showing them targeting infantry units but the amount of RPG attacks is higher. This however is only my observation based on the footage I have seen from them so far. When it comes to the RPG attacks, the videos still lack any damage assessment and the clips simply cut after the hits or the fighters start to retreat immediately after firing. To be honest, in the end there really is not much more they can do given the lack of their equipment and fire support. The lack of body armor and heavy weapons however allows them to exfiltrate faster after their attacks and makes it harder for IDF forces to fix and finish them. Furthermore, they do not wear any military uniforms and conduct all their attacks while wearing civilian clothing. This is a basic tactic during asymmetric warfare that allows them to blend in with the civilian population before, during and after their attacks. Also, their weapons and a limited amount of gear can simply be removed by their comrades in the case one of them gets KIA and the casualty looks like a civilian one for outside observers. But not only combatants acting like non-combatants present a unique obstacle in urban environments. Also non-combatants themselves. First, there is a strategic imperative to minimize civilian casualties which often impacts military operations. Second, non-combatants often do not behave sensibly. And third, when non-combatants have to leave an area or do flee, they often interfere with military operations what can slow down the overall pace of the operations significantly. While, except for one video I cannot share here, all videos of the attacks on armored vehicles lack a visible outcome, there is, however, footage that can serve as damage assessment of these attacks, which I will come to later. While, for my part, I have not seen a notable shift in difference in tactics used by Hamas so far, the Institute for the Study of War reported that since December 1st, Hamas has used increasingly sophisticated tactics against Israeli forces. According to them, they started to deploy more advanced weapons, including explosive drones and anti-tank ammunition, as Israeli operations began to focus more on southern Gaza. Furthermore, they said Hamas and the other Palestinian militias have shifted from conducting a delaying operation to conducting a deliberate defense. I, on my part, however, cannot confirm this for now, but perhaps we will see it in the next Israel-Gaza war update that is already in the works. By the way, I took a few weeks off from all the war stuff and now have a ton of footage to go through. This is a scene that closely reminds of the countless videos from the beginning of the Syrian civil war where the Syrian army sent their tanks into the city of Dara who were then filmed from close range as they were engaging rebel forces. 2019 YouTube forced me to delete all documentation of this but I will not forget and as you can see history repeats itself even if the context is different this time. Earlier in this video, I spoke about the effect of suppression fire and mentioned that I would showcase an example. Well, here it is. It is from a leaked helmet cam that was captured by the IDF. The indicator is that the faces of the fighters are not blurred. While the fighters are not suppressed in this footage, their movement is merely the result of the awareness that their position could be compromised and engaged at any time also with suppression fire. I promised you footage of damage assessment, and here we have it. This clip shows an Israeli Merkava tank that was hit by Hamas and is visibly burning. Despite the damage, it continues to hold its ground, firing back at Palestinian positions. However, this is not the only footage of Israeli tanks after being attacked. Three more videos were released, showing the recovery of more severely damaged Israeli Merkava tanks. The ones we see here were definitely taken out of the fight, and the fate of the crew is unknown. I do not know which attacks caused this damage and I am unsure if these attacks were recorded by Hamas. However, these tanks are the only ones I have seen that have been so heavily damaged since the start of the Israeli ground invasion. 
Last year, we have footage from the turret of a Merkava tank operating in urban terrain. I made a reference to the war in Syria before, and this segment reminds me very much of it. I understand this connection is obvious since both countries are in the Middle East, but still, it stands out. I believe it's because so much footage from that conflict was forever lost, leaving us with only discussions about this nearly forgotten war. It never garnered the attention that conflicts in Ukraine or Gaza received, even during its peak times. As a rule, Armored forces cannot operate in urban environments without dismounted infantry support. In previous wars, the IDF initially favored using armor only to clear urban areas and soon learned that unaccompanied armor strikes were more costly in lives and equipment than those with infantry in support. As you can see, however, tanks still remain central to IDF doctrine for urban operations, specifically using combined arms tactics due to their firepower and protection. Here is another interesting clip showing female Israeli soldiers. With sharing this, I am not only aiming to challenge the worldview of those attempting to frame and categorize me into the far right corner, even if I am also not considering myself to be left or a liberal, but also to ask a question for you. During the fight against the group whose name you get when you pronounce the Spanish word just two times and backwards, the Kurds also liked using female soldiers because the other side feared that they will not go to paradise if they got KI by a woman. Is this also the case for Hamas fighters? I honestly do not know. Does anyone know more and is willing to share it in the comments? This is another pretty interesting video showing an Israeli Iron Dome missile intercepting a Hamas rocket on close range. Overall, the video footage we have seen so far reveals the numerous difficulties and challenges of the urban operations in Gaza. According to Edward Erickson, a former American military officer and retired professor of military history at the Department of War Studies at the Marine Corps University, no other city has presented such a complex battle space as Gaza, surpassing even Aleppo, Mosul, Hugh, Mogadishu, Berlin and Stalingrad. That's why Israel takes its time and is approaching this matter very cautious as I have mentioned several times already even if it often does not look like this especially when it comes to the valid criticism regarding civilian losses. In urban warfare, time plays a crucial role. It's essential for minimizing harm to non-combatants and for the careful planning, preparation and execution of a city attack to maximize the chances of success. Once an urban battle begins, historical evidence indicates that with each passing day, as civilian casualties and collateral damage increase, there's a growing international pressure to halt the fighting. Achieving the objective of neutralizing Hamas military capabilities in Gaza through ground forces will inevitably take weeks, if not months. This extended time frame is an inherent aspect of clearing urban terrain. Israel is very aware of the political and military challenge of time. It has fought almost every war of its history in a race against time, seeking to achieve its goals before international pressure forces it to stop operations. While the Gaza Strip, with its 140 square miles, contains multiple highly dense cities and is home to over 2 million residents, the area is not one of the most densely populated territories on Earth, as some reports have described it, as pointed out in an article by the Modern War Institute at West Point. The problem, however, is that Gaza, compared to other areas and urban battlefields of the past, lacks depth and not really offers any place the civilians can evade to besides Israel itself. What is not possible, obviously, and Egypt, what is also not possible since Egypt refuses to accept Palestinian refugees. This is a really sad fact I simply had to point out here. Another sad fact is that generally speaking, the side that is less concerned with the safety of the civilian population has the advantage. Especially if this is coupled with a disregard for reporting the truth and adeptness at manipulating international opinion. Also, while civilians are a major concern in urban operations, the concerns over collateral damage, be it civilians or property damage and destruction, generally decline as friendly military casualties increase. That's why rules of engagement must be clear given the ambiguous nature of urban warfare, and commanders must balance operational necessity with minimizing civilian casualties and collateral damage. Also, I hope that once this war ends, it becomes clear for all involved parties that urban operations do not end upon completion of hostilities and there must be a plan for post-operation support to the populace to help ensure a return to normalcy for civilians in the urban centers. This said, I once more want to speak about the famous tunnels I already mentioned last time. According to the IDF, over 800 tunnel shafts have been located in Gaza since the beginning of the war from which 500 have so far been destroyed, what is a high number if true. These tunnel shafts have been destroyed using a variety of operational methods, including with explosives and blocks. Some of the tunnel shafts connected Hormuz strategic assets via the underground tunnel network. In addition, many miles of the tunnel roads have been destroyed. Also, the Israeli military began to flood the tunnels with seawater 
what is questionable, but effective as a video that cannot be shown here depicted. Regarding the tunnels, the IDF also stated that after locating the shafts, IDF troops carry out investigations in order to understand the characteristics of the tunnels and then prepare the underground route for its destruction. Here is footage of one of these operations. We can see Israeli forces inspecting the entrance to one tunnel and also further raids against Palestinian weapons caches and tunnels. Defensively, Hamas uses tunnels to escape IDF observation and attacks. Offensively, Hamas tunnels allow the group's forces to conduct protected and surprise attacks. Entering tunnels presents unique tactical challenges, many of which cannot be addressed without specialized equipment. The average Hamas tunnel is just 2 meters high and a meter wide, making entering, moving through and fighting in them extremely hard. Tunnel reconnaissance units, for example, use ground and aerial sensors, ground penetrating radar, drilling equipment, and other systems to fight tunnels. There are radios and navigation technologies that work underground, night vision goggles that use thermal and other technologies to see in complete darkness, and a suite of remote or wire controlled flying or crawling robots that can look into and map tunnels without risking soldiers. That's it for this update. Just one last thing. If you found the content valuable, please show it with a like and comment to please the mighty algorithm bots. Otherwise, I might have to sacrifice a goat or something to get the video to a larger audience. Another Israel Gaza war update is already in the works, along with a Ukraine war update, so be sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and enable all notifications if you don't want to miss it. If you want to see the full update with all the scenes and voiceover I had to cut out of this YouTube video, you are invited to join my private Telegram channel. The link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time.